Hello, Commanders, and welcome back to Elite Dangerous uh, Return from Beagle Point. I keep trying to do the old playlist. Uh, today's topic of discussion will be the future of explora uh, space exploration. In the last episode, we talked about the current state and uh, whether, you know, the way we're doing it is right or maybe not so right, uh, private versus government-funded exploration, all that stuff. Today, we're going to talk about what the future of ex uh, space exploration might look like, uh, depending on the directions in the past and stuff that we go. But before we do that, as always, we're going to bring our new faces into the fold by uh, letting you guys know what's going on. Super Cruise Fitman. With your help, we have finalized and released a new frame drive mine of this over overcharged during Super Cruise. Uh, okay, I don't know what that means. Uh, so, uh, the purpose of our journey has been to increase our exobiology rank up to elite, as well as hopefully save up enough money to buy a fleet carrier. Uh, there's a cycle of operations that we typically do. As you can see, we pop the discovery scanner when we hop into a system, we do some fuel scooping. Then we'll hop into the full spectrum system scanner to see if there are any Earth-like worlds, ammonia worlds, or water worlds. Uh, there are, there do not appear to be any in this system. So we're going to go ahead and start doing a full-on scan of the system, looking for biological signatures. I generally set a limit of about 15 bodies, uh, which I feel is a good balance between, you know, stopping often enough to actually look for bodies, uh, look for biology versus actually making decent time towards a destination. So that's kind of the way that we do things here. Uh, for now, we're going to finish scanning up this system. And then, so we see geological features out there in the top right. We're looking for a biological. And I want to find at least two on a body if we're going to expend the time to fly over there and try to get it done. All right, so that's the uh, standard spiel I do for the new people who are joining us just now. Uh, we'll get to the topic of discussion here in a second when I'm able to focus my brain a little bit more. It's kind of hard to talk about complex topics and focus on doing this at the same time. So let's uh, finish looking around here. Kind of do a little bit of back and forth. Is it behind the star? Does it? Oh, no, there it is. All right, does not appear that we're going to have a biological source in this system, so we'll move on. So in the last episode, we talked about how I think that the direction that we're going is actually pretty good. There's a nice contrast between a, you know, the bold vision that some of the private organizations tend to have versus the very methodical and well thought out uh, plans that NASA as a government organization tends to follow. And I think that we need both aspects of that to uh, reach this the, the realistic goal that we have of hopefully one day colonizing the solar system. And now that said, um, I do have to say that I agree with a gentleman by the name of Eric Weinstein when he says that we don't, I don't think we focus enough on really going after some wild physics and trying to break through this uh, this box that we put ourselves in when it comes to say the speed limit of light or light light being the speed limit of the universe and um, you know Einstein rel uh, the general theory of relativity and all that I mean obviously those are things that are important and they give us a reliable model oh that's way too far away we're not even gonna bother with those they give us every they give us a reliable set of principles from which to work from where we can predict things in the real world and they're absolutely valid however that being said i think that I, I think i agree when with the sentiment that too many of us have allowed ourselves to think that uh because we have this rule set it must be the only way and there's no other options now obviously there's always research going on out there looking for cool new ways of uh, looking at physics and trying to find ways to break the laws of physics and I think you know that's a good thing that we should be doing but um, I, I, I do wonder if our progress is being stifled by it, we're being I think we may be being stifled by a mentality that is present in a lot of fields of academia um, you see it where the problem is is that experts tend to become intractable I guess is the word I'm looking for. It looks like we will have a water world in this system. So if it's not too far away, we'll go ahead and grab it. Um, the problem with becoming an expert is that you you tend to start be believing that you are right and everyone else is wrong. And was that the water world? All right, let's target that one. Um, 
and you become less and, and especially the longer you're an expert in something you be, the less and less open you are to new ideas all right so here's biological we're looking for at least two though so there is something to be said for progress being oh another one progress being stifled because certain people have decided that they know what's going on and the rest of us just have to suck it up and listen you know why am i doing all right i'm not gonna f there's too many there's too many bodies to be doing the rest of this so we'll just go ahead and um head over to the first of the water worlds we'll get that scanned and then we'll move on to the next system because 27 bodies is a lot um can we get to there all right i i i know there's a lot of controversy out there with certain topics uh, I really like the Ancient Apocalypse TV series on Netflix, and it makes a lot of sense to me, not just because, you know, it's a cool theory, but just a lot, a lot of the arguments at least make sense to me. And there, there's a community, there's a large community of experts out there who are unwilling to at least entertain the ideas proposed by the gentleman who, who has been doing that for his whole life. You know, I can understand being skeptical of it, but there's a difference between being skeptical and just refusing to listen because you think you're so sure that you're right that no one else can come in with a different idea. He could be completely entirely wrong, and that's totally fine. And, you know, people who want to go after... Sorry, I thought I heard a weird noise. People who want to go after, uh, you know, completely new ideas of physics could be completely out of their mind. But you won't know until you check it out and try to go after the things and we definitely i definitely feel like we've entered into a period of time where too many people think they know think they know what's what and they're unwilling to you know i don't know we've lost our sense i feel like a lot of us have, the society in general especially in the west has lost our sense of adventure like everybody just wants to have things set and done and not have to think about it anymore and you know, that's kind of putting us in a box that prevents us from moving. I think it's a pretty bad way to go. Um, and, you know, bringing it back to the topic of space exploration, obviously, um, it would be awesome if we could get to a place where maybe we have some form of... some form of civilization like we see in The Expanse, that TV show that was very popular for quite a long time. You know, getting out into the solar system is obviously better than nothing. Uh, that's definitely something that we want to be trying to do. And we have the technology more or less to do it. Maybe not as efficiently and as timely as, say, something like the Expanse, where they come up with a new form of rocket propulsion. But we have the ability to do it. It just requires a lot of work and effort. Um, but at the same time... You know, the, the amount of time it's going to take us to do that is orders of magnitude longer than it would be if we could come up with some uh, orders of magnitude more than if we came up with some way to exceed the, the speed of light. And that really should be something that many, many more people are focusing on, even if everything we see is telling us that the speed of light is impossible, it's, poss it's impossible to go faster than the speed of light. Regardless of whether it's regardless of whether it looks possible or not, even if it's 99.999% chance that we can't do it, we should still be investing every possible effort into trying in, into that last little bit of percent of chance on, you know, cuz that's the that's the complete civilization changer. If we can get to where we can break the speed of light, we completely change as a species. We're no longer confined, not only are we no longer confined to this world, but we're also able to branch out into many, many other worlds in a way that would be completely different from having to do it the old fashioned way, basically. <laughs> now, I am a big fan of a, a YouTube channel, Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur. I actually haven't watched too many of his videos lately, but um, especially a lot of his older content uh, was very interesting and got me really interested in a lot of different ideas that I think about now. Uh, one of them namely being just the idea that uh, there's a good chance that we're alone either in either in our completely alone in the universe or at, at the very least in this part of the universe and uh the reason for that is just the number of sequential steps that have to happen to allow a sentient life form 
that becomes capable of the kind of technological advancement that allows you to expand out into space. The, the, the sheer number of variables and steps that have to happen in a relatively limited amount of time based on the lifetime of a star are so many and so unlikely to happen that the chances of there being any kind of intelligent life near us seems to be astronomically small. And if there are, they're probably not in this galaxy or even in even any, any of the nearby galaxies. Um, we, we hear about Drake's equation and, and it makes it seem like there should, there should be so many worlds and all of this other stuff. And it's like, well, yeah, but I mean, at the same time, you're, you're making some pretty... You're making some pretty generous assumptions with that equation. Uh, they came up with a list of just 50 sequential things that have to happen in order with, and gave them uh, one in, uh, gave them a, 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 they did the odds with a coin flip odds and then a one in six chance odds. And either way, both of them were very, very unlikely to produce life near us. And if, and if there were, if there was life near us, it's it's not uh, it's not cl like near us. And when I say near us, I mean like in the same galaxy as us. Not <laughs> if they're on the other side of the galaxy, the odds that we're that we're going to find them anytime soon are very small. Now, obviously, those those odds go the the chance the, the 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 numbers go out the window if faster than light travel is a thing, and we can go faster than the speed of light, and we can go infinitely faster than the speed of light. Then obviously, that's a different thing. But Realistically, assuming that the rules that we have now, if you know, if we're going to follow that, then you know, I, I'm I'm fairly comfortable in saying that we're probably alone. We may be the first biological species that has a chance of getting out into space. That is a real possibility. And uh, too many people, too many people are, too many people don't want to hear that. They want they want there to be something else out there. They want to have that uh, to whatever that sense of hope you get of there being something else out there and you know i don't know it's, there's a good chance that there is a very good chance that we are the only ones we might be the infinite the infinite lottery winner and that uh that's a hard thing to that's a hard thing to accept when you grew up believing that we were going to go out into the galaxy and meet all kinds of other species and you know discover all different kinds of life forms and stuff and then we go out there and it's all just a bunch of nothing <laughs> Yeah, that's not. Uh, I don't think that's what m most people wanted to he want to hear. But anyways, uh, despite that, when it comes to the future of space exploration, well, obviously there are a few different pathways that we could take. One of them, obviously, is the, uh, you know, we we've taken rockets about as far as we can outside of maybe finding a way to, uh, maybe finding a way to do something similar to the expanse where we're able to get some kind of insane efficiency out of our propulsion systems that allows us to, you know, do 1G plus burns for weeks or months at a time. Obviously, that would be something that would allow us to expand a lot faster. But, um, you know, even if we're stuck with rockets, it's been shown over and over again that we could colonize the galaxy with the technology that we have now. It's just going to take a very, very, very long time. Uh, by our standards, I mean, when you look at the timelines, it's it's hundreds of millions of years for us to spread out to the edge of the galaxy, depending on you know how, how aggressive we are with it. But you know, on, in, when we, when we're talking about many billions of years of universe existence, that's not that's like a blink of an eye, realistically. But on a human scale, it's a very, very, very long time. Um, so you know, that's obviously the default situation that we're in rockets and the basic technology rockets and ion drives and, and you know all the stuff that we have right now that allows us to do what we're doing uh, they talk about some laser propulsion solar sails all that kind of stuff all of those things are things that we could do that would allow can we okay that would allow us to move out not only into the solar system but also to nearby stars and just slowly 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 branch out into other areas of our nearby solar region. Now, that being said, that's not the preferred way if we can find a way around that. I don't think anybody wants to spend hundreds of hundreds of millions of years or, or even just hundreds of thousands of years uh, slowly branching our way out into the galaxy. We want to be able to go and explore and see things and 
that requires some kind of faster than light travel. Now, you know, there's a lot of different theories out there as to how that could work. Obviously, I think the most developed version as far as, you know, at the number of people who have looked at it and as well as just in popular culture is warp drive. Um, me personally, based off of the papers, and I, I've never, now I haven't read any of the papers, but I've read summaries of papers, and I do know that the Alcubierre warp drive is something that, at least the last information that I saw, is something that could feasibly be done if we could figure out whatever this negative energy thing is. And if you don't know anything about warp drive and you're just popping into this video, well, you're going to have to go do some research because I... I understand it enough to understand what I'm talking about. I don't understand it enough to explain it to you. So you're going to have to go uh, watch a video on warp drives or uh, you're going to have to go read about, you know, dark energy, dark mass, negative energy, all that stuff. Um, I, I don't understand it well enough to explain it here in this topic. But anyways, obviously that would be a really cool way of moving around the galaxy, especially um, I don't know if anybody, maybe you, maybe some of you could let me know, maybe you've read something there. Uh, I would imagine that because the physical matter that we are inside of a warp bubble won't actually be moving at the speed of moving past the speed of light. I don't know if the time lapse of relativity that we that they talk about how like time moves time moves slower for you when you're moving the, the faster you're moving than it does for people who are slower than you. So you know, they keep saying warp drive is time travel. Uh, you know, you spend a month in warp and then you get to where you're going and it's hundreds of thousands of years later or something like that. Um, how many bodies were in here? I was only halfway paying attention. That's not what I meant. I want the full spectrum system scanner. How many bodies are here? Yeah, that's too many. Let's go ahead and move on. Um, but I'd be curious to know, and I, you know, I could look it up, but, you know, I want some channel engagement. So somebody who knows about this stuff, uh, have, have they, does the math tell us that we're protected from time dilation inside of a warp bubble? Or is that something that we still get affected by because, because the warp is affecting space, not necessarily us. So I would think that we'd be protected from that inside the bubble and time would pass normally based off of what time was inside the bubble when we started. Something like that. Um... So obviously, I think I think a lot of us, especially people like me who grew up on Star Trek, really want warp drive to be a thing because that's the thing we're most familiar and comfortable with. But obviously, there's other ways of moving around that have been theoretically postulated, such as you know folding space in a way to bring your to bring two points of the two points in the universe together, so that you don't even have to travel the distance. You just you know create a create a shortcut basically between two points. That would be a really cool way to go. You could go anywhere in the universe using that, assuming we could figure out how to, you know, create a little a little shortcut tunnel like that. Uh, there's just there's so many different ways out there that we could go that you know you could spend you could spend several episodes talking about them, and I I don't know enough about most of them to speak intelligently on them, so I'm not even going to try. Um, I'm going to say that. If I'm if I was a betting man, and I'm not, but if I was a betting man, I would think that. I would think that some form of the expanse is some is the way our future is going to go, and I'll tell you, I'll, t I'll give you a couple reasons why I think that. First, first, obviously, most scientists right now are saying that the warp drive is not something that we could do, not because the not because physics doesn't allow it, but because it requires a type of energy that we don't even know exists yet, and. Even if we, even if we theoretically think that it might, we have no way of really. Oh, biological source. We're gonna go after that. We have no way of actually, you know, testing for it right now. We're not even sure how to start testing for it. Last I, last I heard. So, you know, this exotic form of energy that we would need to be able to create a warp bubble in the first place is something we don't know about. And uh, so we're kind of stuck with the physics that we have right now until somebody makes some kind of a breakthrough that allows us to do that. So that said, that makes me feel like, you know, at least in the at least in the near future, and I mean, you know, the next hundred, couple hundred or thousand plus years, we may we're probably going to be stuck in uh, uh, a thousand light seconds. Let's get ourselves locked in on this guy with super cruise assist. Uh, what did this say? Uh, 
f new frame shift drive module with the ability to overcharge during a super cruise. Stock of this module should be ready at hundreds of markets. I don't understand what that, what does that mean? The ability to overcharge during super cruise. Um, okay, well, whatever that means, I don't know. So obviously, you know, our limited, our, our limitations in physics right now and exper and the ability to experiment in that in that arena is is something that's obviously going to push us push my my feelings in the directions of we're probably going to have something we're we're going to we're going to try to push rocket technology or the 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 physics physical propulsion technology whatever it is that we're using we're, gonna, we're probably going to try to push that to the point where we can get to where we can do one or two or maybe even 3G burns flip over and do it the other way and, and try to minimize our time. And obviously that's still the very slow compared to some of the theoretical ways we could move, but it's better than what we have right now. Um, the other reason I think that that's probably the, uh, a really strong possibility is just that human nature. Um, when you see something like The Expanse, the reason why that resonates with you is because that's the human experience. Human beings exploit each other. Human beings treat each other like crap. And you're always going to have factions in any kind of human society where some people are trying to exploit other people for their own personal benefit. It would be, it's nice to think that we might end up like Star Trek and everything. everybody gets what they want and nobody has to do this and everybody everybody's happy and great and all of that. But the reality is, is that human nature prevents us from doing that. Not because, not because there aren't enough of us who care. I think the vast majority of people care, but when, at the end of the day, when it comes down to, you know, I need what I need or I want what I want versus the, the things that other people need around you, very few people are willing to make the kind of sacrifices necessary to create the kind of society that I think we all wish we could have. Because realistically, you make a sacrifice and then a lot of other people don't make the sacrifice. And then you end up wasting your sacrifice and you know that that's a strong possibility. So why am I going to waste Why am I going to waste my life away for a future that A, I'm never going to see and B, probably isn't going to happen because everybody's selfish. That's hard, that, you know. That's a crappy way to think, but it's the way that we think. It's the way that most human beings think. So... You know, when I look at the future of space exploration, you know, there's a couple of different facets that you have to look at. It's it's not just how are we going to get out into space. It's what kind of what kind of existence are we going to have once we do or if we do. And you know, I personally think that it's going to be more like. Okay, seriously, I turned you off. I did turn you off. Stop controlling me. Uh, it's going to be more like Star Wars and less less like Star Trek. And that's just because we all have to we all have to have a little bit of a reality check and understand that humans are not going to change enough over the next hundred several hundred years to create the kind of society that Gene Roddenberry dreamed up in the freaking 60s or whenever it was. It's just that's not going to happen. It, it, I, we, I think we all wish that it would. And, you know, and, and I know I'm being a naysayer when I say that, but. I think we all intuitively understand that the future is not and never will be the kind of utopia that everybody, that a lot of people seem to want. Um, you're always going to have to protect yourself from people who want to exploit you, regardless of what system that you're in. And because you have to live that way, we can't have the kind of, we can't have the kind of system that requires the, uh, the, the level of trust that that kind of society would ha have to have. So, yeah. And then, you know, because we, we see it all the time. All right, am I going to crash? What's going on here? Because we see it all the time in, you know, the most advanced societies that we have now. There, you have all these people who have the ability to do so much, but they hoard their resources and keep it to themselves. What is this? They hoard their resources and you know, take a massive piece of the pie and they refuse to give anything to anybody else. Uh, you know, uh, that's a generalization. Obviously, there are many out there with a lot who give a lot, but I'm just saying there's a lot of people out there who don't. And, you know, there's a reason for that. We human beings are hoarder. Stratum Aeronamus. Aran, <laughs> okay. I don't know how you pronounce that, but that's the first time we've ever come across that particular kind of stratum, and it looks pretty cool. I would think that would be worth more than the Tectonicus. The Tectonicus looks boring. 
Um, so, you know, that that's most of what I have to say about the future of... Okay, do I have... I forgot to put my throttle down. I'm like, why am I yanking forward and I'm not even pressing the button? Uh, okay, can I land here? So, yeah. That's that's most of what I have to say about the future of space travel. Obviously, that's a that's a topic that you could go on endlessly about, get into the nitty gritty details. Uh, personally, I think we're we're going to be in for more of an expanse type future uh, rather than a Star Trek type future. Um, even if we get faster than light travel, then we, then it goes from being an expanse type future into more of a Star Wars type future. I just I don't think with human nature that. Um, you know, the Star Trek style of making things work is ever going to happen. We're all, we're too, we're too, biolo we're biologically, we're too selfish, we're too self-centered, we're too, you know, we're too worried about what's best for us rather than what's best for the community because that's just, that's, that's the way that most organisms, that's the way most organisms work. Um, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that is what it is. I'm hoping that this is far enough away. I don't personally think that there's anything wrong with being selfish as long as your selfishness isn't, you know, adversely affecting someone else. Mm, can I get a landing spot here? We had... Oh, there we go. <clears throat> I mean, we we all put a we all put a stigma on people who are out for themselves and want to make their own lives better. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, or in, and I certainly don't think it's wrong. It's when that selfishness turns into you're willing to do things that hurt other people that it becomes a real problem. All right, well, we just got ourselves a new thing for our codex because I'm pretty sure we haven't gotten. The, oh, why did I do that? Because is. Uh, I'm going to hop back out and see if maybe there's a bacterium nearby, because I thought I saw one pretty close. And I wasn't thinking about it when we hop back into the ship here. But if not, we can always turn around and... Is that... Yeah, I think that's a bacteria. Is this the bacteria? That would be cool. Looks like this might be more of that stratum, though. That's okay. We'll run over here and grab this guy. Then we'll flip over and grab a couple more of the bacteria in the other direction, and then we can go ahead and be done for today. No, if I can, if I can have the tool come out. So yeah, my uh, I, I tend while I am a very interested in you know science fiction slash science future, um, I'm also a very a fairly philosophical kind of person, and I know enough about human nature and the way human beings are and you look at history, and history is a very good indicator as to what people are going to do in this situation or that situation. And it's hard to look at the future and see a selfless one, because we just we gener we generally just don't do that. Okay, so try to land here. Grab this guy here, and then we'll grab one more, and that should be good. Ready to go. Let's say we landed on one. Shouldn't have to go find one. Okay, uh, one more to go, and we are good with Bacterium Cerberus. We have seen Cerberus before, though. Cerberus kind of Cerberus looks kind of cool because it always looks a little bit like neon. Especially with front, especially from the air, it looks kind of it looks kind of like it's bioluminescent or something. I don't think it is because even in, when we're in the dark, it doesn't. We never see it like glowing or anything, but it just appears sort of bioluminescent when you're looking at it. Can I land here? Oh, come on, let me land. All right, well, 
Hopefully you guys had lots of fun. Be sure to click that like button if you did so that the YouTube algorithm will know and send the video out to as many people as possible. If you're not subscribed, please consider doing so now so that when the next video comes out, it will show up in your feed and you will be able to watch it as soon as it becomes available. Channel members do get early access to all of my content, so be sure to click that join button, check out the list of options available there and decide if any of those are right for you. If you're not interested in a membership, you can always click that thanks button. It's YouTube's version, uh, YouTube's form of a tip. Direct contributions such as these are greatly appreciated and a critical component to helping to turn this into a full-time gig, which is the dream. So again, thank you very much for your time. Hope you guys have been enjoying the journey. Be sure to come back for the next episode, and I'll see you then.